sommes pas fous, nous ne sommes pas ivres, nous sommes juste dans la joie. Une joie profonde, nos cœurs elle inonde, cette joie elle vient du ciel, non, nous ne sommes pas fous. Welcome to Sing With Your Feet, the podcast during which you unpeel the sole of your Cinderella slipper from the tar on the steps of the palace and start full speed ahead, escaping from this unsatisfying fairy tale in which you found yourself, and hopefully making imperceptible but satisfying progress towards your ideal life. My name is Lily Fields, and I'm going to be your fairy godmother for the next half hour or so. Did you bring your magic wand? Oh, you didn't? Well, not to worry. <laughs> I have mine, and that should be enough to get us through, for today at least. Now, wait a second, Lily. Uh, that's you talking. I hope you're not offended that I'm making you sound like a southern belle. It's just one of the only accents I know how to do. Um, I, I take issue on three points. Uh, number one, my life is no fairy tale. Number two, I, I didn't ask for a fairy godmother. And number three, I definitely don't have a magic wand. Well, I'll agree with you on your first point. Your life isn't a fairy tale. I might have gotten a little carried away with my metaphors there at the beginning. What I think I know about your life is this, and I say this with great compassion. You barely recognize your life. You barely recognize yourself when you look in the mirror anymore. Your life got away from you, as if at the stroke of midnight you turned back into a mouse or, or a bird or, let me speak for myself here, back into a pumpkin. It got away from you when you gave up your career to care for your children and began playing a bit part in someone else's story. You stopped existing. You stopped dreaming. You stopped pursuing joy. Yes, admittedly, to benefit a new chapter of your own story with its own plot line and interesting new antagonists. Um, did I say antagonists? I, I meant heroes. <laughs> You're heroes. This new storyline was forged at the detriment of your self-respect, your self-esteem, and, again, I'm only speaking for myself here, but this new life was forged at the detriment of any sense of pleasure. Or perhaps your life got away from you when you retired, after a long and fruitful career, only to realize that you can't sit still, and you certainly can't stand the silence, which is why you're listening to a self-proclaimed fairy godmother wax poetic about fairy tales. For years, you skillfully managed to exist in the doing, and when there was nothing left to do, well, you started wondering why you were on Earth at all. Now, to address your second point, I'll also grant that you probably didn't ask for a fairy godmother. Well, you didn't do it out loud, if that's any assurance at all, for those of you who tend to speak their thoughts and get sideways glances for it. Yet again, I'm only speaking for myself here. <clears throat> But I'd be willing to bet if you have ever felt like you lost your voice and your place in this world for any reason, you might have wished that you could just start over. And that's what I'm here to help you do. Not start over from scratch, for sure, because that's way above my pay grade. But I am here to help you take a look at what you have, what raw materials you were given at birth, what dreams you have buried, what it is that makes you feel alive, and help you imagine what your ideal life would look like with those elements restored to it. Hold on to those two words, ideal life. We're going to be coming back to those over and over again. If today, what you imagine when you hear the words ideal life is a chateau and a prince charming, so be it. But I hope to convince you by the end of the season that by giving your active, enthusiastic consent to the life you currently have, and the circumstances in which you currently find yourself, you can do better than a chateau and a handsome prince. You can unapologetically be the person you were created to be. Now, after that digression, let's return to your objections. I believe you said, I don't have a magic wand. <laughs> oh, my poor little country bumpkin. This is me putting my hands on your dainty little shoulders and gently shaking you. Yes, you do have a magic wand. 
you have a magic wand that looks a lot like determination on a good day, stubbornness on a bad day. You have industriousness and desire, a bevy of other treasures too, some you may know about, and some you have either by your own hands or by the inevitable weight of life and responsibilities and doubt and fear. You have plenty of other treasures that you buried in your backyard and you forgot about. You have them. You also have hope. And and before you contradict me on that, let me tell you this. I have hope enough for the both of us. So, would you come on this adventure with me? Would you like to get your pretty little slipper unstuck and start pursuing contentment and purpose and satisfaction? Give me your hand. Here's a little fairy dust and off we go. Can I be honest about something? I don't know that I believe in self-help. While this podcast may be categorized as self-improvement or self-help, I'm just going to say this up front. Neither of these, neither self-improvement nor self-help, are possible or even imaginable if we don't know who we are. Does this sound obvious? Maybe it is, but I just have so many complicated thoughts in my head that sometimes I forget what is obvious. For what it's worth, here's what I think on the subject. We spend so much time hoping for and scheming... Did I say scheming? I think I meant working for what we don't have, whether that thing is a good job or well-behaved children or a nice house or status or that fabulous little white Volvo SUV with a supple beige leather interior. Oops. (laughs) I think I got a little carried away there. (laughs) We spend so much time working for those things that we aren't ready for them when they come our way. Once those things land in our laps, we're happy for a moment, but then we quickly experience letdown. Letdown can be loud, and it can sound a lot like buyer's remorse. It can be a very, very painful regret. And likewise, letdown can be insidious and sneaky. It's a private, unpronounceable misery. Is this all there is? It whispers. We can become disappointed and start hungering for the next thing we want, Because who we are hasn't caught up with our dreams yet. We start looking for something, anything that we think will make us happy. That impossibly perfect thing that will stop all of our longing and finally make us complete. And then we start hoping. And hoping is followed quickly by scheming. And there we are, back at the beginning again. I call this the cycle of the imperfect life. And my mission, for as long as I have breath in my lungs and fairy dust to spread around, is to figure out how to break this cycle. I want to break it for me. I want to break it for my children. If the only thing that ever happens is that one person understands that unless they love who they are, with all their flaws and imperfections, and speak kindly to themselves, that they will never be satisfied... If only one person understands this and pursues an adventure in getting to know themselves and who they want to be, then I will have done my job, both as a parent to two little earthlings and as your temporary godmother. What would be great is if that one person I spoke of a second ago, if that one person were you. I want to become a person who can enjoy the successes, both big and small, The successes I work hard for without immediately wanting something else, without immediately setting a new goal, without immediately finding a new object for my affections. My mission is to become a person who can authentically, in harmony with who I am in my deepest core, stop criticizing myself for my failures and my unintentional errors and for my very bad decisions. A person who can forgive herself who can have faith that there is a future beyond what I currently see and knows the depths of the resources at my disposition when that faith is well placed. As it turns out, the secret to living our ideal life is not found in what we want to possess or the relationships we want to have, but rather to know what virtues we want to possess and to have imagined the kind of person we are in our ideal life. To haphazardly wish for what we don't have would be like trying to do a gigantic puzzle without the box cover to compare it to. Overwhelming and ultimately disappointing. 
once we have imagined the kind of person we want to be remembered as, we are able to make choices that get us closer to those ideals. Just a quick warning, I'm going to be talking about the eventuality of death in this part. If that bothers you, just skip forward five minutes. Here I go. I have gone to a lot of funerals in my day. I am neither a funeral director nor a mortician, but funerals are something of a side gig, you know, for when I'm not doing this fairy godmother shtick. I love a good funeral. I kind of fell backwards into this funeral gig, but it has ended up being one of the most fruitful and beautiful parts of my life. Wait, wait, <laughs> don't stop listening now. I promise this is not going to be morbid, and I promise it's going somewhere. You've surely heard of The Wedding Singer? Sure, if you're thinking of the late 90s Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore film, I wouldn't blame you. That's kind of the idea. But me, you see, I'm a funeral singer. As some people are said to have a face for radio, well, I have a voice for funerals, you see. I was trained as a classical singer, which, short of being absolutely laser-focused on making it a career, is not a particularly useful talent to possess. Sure, I can sing the Queen of the Night, but do I have the wherewithal to audition nonstop and face perennial rejection? Absolutely not. But ask me to sing at your funeral, and I'll sing anything you want to hear. From Mozart to the Beatles, from Haydn to Frank Sinatra, but wait, don't you ask me to sing at your funeral because that would just be weird. <laughs> My role at a funeral is to create a safe container in which people can simply let themselves be carried, carried by the confusing wave of emotions they're feeling on a little rowboat of beautiful music. My role is to be invisible, to bring my compassion and my sensitivity, and to simply console people with my voice. Now, I would take a funeral over a wedding any day, and I know that's a controversial statement. To be slightly more specific and less morbid, I'd take a funeral of someone elderly who had all of his health and all of his mind who died peacefully in his sleep over a wedding any day. I prefer to celebrate a life well lived than attend an arbitrary cultural ritual which seeks to whitewash the uncertainty and fickleness of love, and you can debate me on that. I am frequently called upon to sing a classical piece of music at funerals, a gig which I always accept with great seriousness. I have sung at just about any kind of funeral you can imagine, including a biker funeral at which representatives of every biker gang in France were in attendance the funeral of a small child who drowned in a tragic accident, and the funeral of a father and a son who died in unrelated incidents in the same week. I have attended many, many, many funerals. You may think, if you aren't a funeral connoisseur, that when people get up to talk about the defunct, they only have nice things to say, and let me debunk that for you. I have sat through a number of public excoriating discourses by the family of the dead, spoken with cold hostility, at a casket. Some funerals are more memorable than others. Ones like that, that other one I just talked about, I wish I could forget. There are a few that stick in my thoughts, though, and in a good way. The one where the deceased's quiet arrangement with one member of the family was that his casket be walked out of the chapel to a New Orleans jazz version of oh, When the Saints Go Marching In. He was a man known for his sense of humor, and he really did have everyone laughing to the last. There was the humble man who while he was living, chose the very simplest pine casket. He was someone who touched everyone by his humility while he was alive, and here he was, reminding us of it when he said goodbye. There was the generous, thoughtful woman whose funeral could have lasted for a week had every single person who had been a recipient of her generosity in some way been given even one single minute to tell her story. Okay, 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 don't stop listening yet. I will stop being morbid. Because once the funeral is over and I am safely back in my car, I inevitably will ask myself, what will my loved ones say about me when I'm gone? I said earlier that the ideal life is like a puzzle, maybe even multiple puzzles, the pieces of which are all dumped on a very large table for us to sift through. When we know what the puzzle we want to complete looks like, when we have the box cover for that puzzle, it becomes easier to start working on that puzzle. We can reject the pieces that don't belong to our puzzle 
even if they do seem interesting and sometimes even tempting, and start piece by piece, little corner by little corner and section by section, assembling the puzzle. Obviously, this metaphor has flaws. I mean, sometimes life throws us curveballs. Mine, for example, are shaped like two little boys and they talk very, very, very loudly. Those little scalawags who showed up in my life six and almost five years ago, respectively, were not on the puzzle box cover I would have imagined for myself even ten years ago. Even now, I sometimes struggle to fit their presence into my puzzle, but they represent a very meaningful redesign of the image on my puzzle box cover. Redesigns are legit and necessary. I have spent years imagining what I wanted my life to look like. When I first started imagining my ideal life, it was back when I was a teenager, and it was all about what I wanted to do. This is totally legit too, and it has a very important function as we face adulthood. Knowing what we want to do can, if we're motivated and have the right connections, help us select our summer jobs, our university studies, our career paths. It can help us select our mate, where we want to live, where we want to work. This is totally, totally legit. There comes a day for many of us, however, when we realize that knowing we, what we want to do, it just doesn't satisfy anymore. Or what we thought we wanted was misguided. For me, even the very good things I wanted to do, and that I did do, didn't satisfy me anymore. What I needed to determine was who I wanted to be. And that's where the question comes in, the question I ask myself in the car after a funeral. What would I want them to say at my funeral? It's really not that dark to ask yourself this question. If anything, it's one of the most enlightening, honest questions we can ask ourselves. This is the question which I truly believe is the foundational piece to start as we imagine our ideal life. What do I think my loved ones would say about me at my funeral? They were very, very honest. Well, my children would probably say that I was more interested in keeping to the schedule than actually connecting with them, but I also think that they would admit that I have saintly patience with their temper tantrums. My husband, who has known me for 25 years, probably would, as a symbolic gesture, wear a neck brace to signify all the ways in which I gave him whiplash over the years. My musician friends would probably say I was effervescent and talented. My normal friends would say that I was authentic and not afraid to own up to my own faults. But honestly, I don't want to be remembered for being more interested in keeping to our schedule than connecting with my boys. I would rather be remembered for my sense of humor than for being effervescent or talented. I do want to be remembered for being authentic and unafraid to be honest about my shortcomings. And I truly want my husband to remember me for being a woman of great industriousness and resourcefulness, not as the one whose mood swings gave him whiplash. I believe that what we would want the people we love to say at our funeral is like the edge pieces on our puzzle. Those are the character traits we want to be remembered for. And those character traits are what I like to call virtues. Now, virtue is admittedly an incredibly unpopular and uncool topic. However, I believe it forms the external contours of our ideal life. And that is why, while I won't bore you with this topic too much in our first season of the podcast, I think you'll see that it's a worthwhile pursuit. I can hear that objection forming in your thoughts. But Lily, I'll never be perfect, you're saying. No, 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 you won't. And neither will I. Besides, virtue does not equate to perfection. And I will not hear any arguments to the contrary. I will struggle with my pride and my ostrich brain and my self-centeredness probably until the day I die. You may struggle with your temper, your inability to listen, or your desire for solitude until the day you die. The point is not to make us perfect by eliminating what makes us awful human beings. The point is to decide the good things we want to be remembered for, and then making it our life's work that people remember us that way. I've thrown a lot at you just now, but before we say goodbye today, I want to tell you a quick story. Here I am, 
sitting on a bench at a public park in late September. I'm here because those two little scalawags that were not on my original jigsaw puzzle box, they need to get worn out before we can get started on our evening routine. I'm knitting. T'es qui toi? says a little voice behind me. Who are you? they're asking. The voice was high-pitched, and I'll be honest, it was really irritating, because I was knitting, you see. I was counting my stitches while I was working on a lovely, complicated little cable, and this annoying little voice made me lose my count. No. Most normal people don't knit on a public bench at a kitty park. I am well aware of that. Merci beaucoup. But I do, because it makes me happy to knit, or to darn, or to spin wool in public. And so, honestly, this innocent little activity which helps me maintain my sanity during long afternoons spent waiting for my scallow eggs to wear themselves out running, climbing, and shouting has been the origin of plenty of interesting conversations with other parents, and sometimes even other children. Oh, so that's how a sweater is made, they might say, or, oh, my grandmother used to do that. It's immediately more personal and less mind-numbing than talking about the weather. But on this particular day, the question was not, tu fais quoi? That is, what are you doing? The question was, t'es qui toi? That is, who are you? I was taken off guard. I could have answered. I'm the mother of that boy dressed up like Batman over there, because my youngest was wearing a Batman costume for no other reason than to feel the cape float in the breeze while he zoomed around his, the park on his bicycle. Or I also could have answered, I am the mother of that boy who's making dust over on the soccer field, uh, because my eldest loves it when it hasn't rained in a while and the soccer field is very, very, very dry and he can kick up lots of dust. I have no idea what I did to that child to make him find this so much fun, but I digress. Instead, I turned and I looked at the kid who asked me the question, and since I really didn't feel like talking about my boys, whose behavior would have been difficult to explain, I just said, I'm Lily, and who are you? So, that's where we are today, my friend. You and me, on a park bench, introducing ourselves. Sit down. Oh, don't worry about that, I'll move it, it's just my knitting. I lost count of my stitches anyway, can't imagine why. My name is Lily. I have been married to a French philosophy teacher since 1999, and believe me, he deserves to be wearing that neck brace we talked about earlier. It ain't always been fairy dust and handsome princes. We have two scalawags, a dust razor born in 2015 and a superhero born in 2017. If you have even the most basic grasp of math, you will understand that there's a story behind those numbers. I hope over the next few episodes to share some of those stories. In the meantime, I want to give you a little bit of homework. I want you to get out a piece of paper and a pen. At the top of the page, I want you to write the words, In my ideal life, I am a person who... I'll repeat that. In my ideal life, I am a person who... Dot, dot, dot. And then, I want you to start finishing that sentence. Because that is where the magic begins. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate it on your podcatcher so that other people might find it and enjoy it too. Or even better, share it with somebody who you think might need a fairy godmother. I would love to hear from you as we start this adventure together. I'm on Instagram as Lily Fields Challenge. Or you can reach me on my blog, where you can also read about my sundry attempts at learning how to live a simpler life. And that can be found at my home on the web at www.lilyfieldschallenge.com. I'd like to give a special thanks to Jonathan Moulin, professional naysayer, and Eric Muller, professional Lego artist, for helping me get this podcast off the ground. Also, un grand merci to Seven Production for the use of the song La Joie for the intro and outro of the show. To Matt Kugler, who sang it, and Claude Equé, who wrote it. You guys always bring La Joie. Well, this is your fairy godmother signing off. I just want to remind you, it is never too late to start singing with your feet.